No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space. No one could have dreamed that we were being scrutinized as someone with a microscope studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets, and yet, across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. Let's talk about War of the Worlds, one of the most important sci-fi stories ever told. And just by saying the words War of the Worlds, you no doubt have a rather impactful image in your head about what War of the Worlds means to you. Are we talking about the 1953 movie or the often forgotten TV series that came after it? Perhaps Spielberg's 2005 movie or the other two not so known movies that came out the same year? Perhaps it's not the movies at all but the infamous radio broadcast that apparently scared a nation so much that it resulted in families fleeing their homes, running away from the invading Martians, believing that what they had heard was true. Or perhaps you are a more traditional type and it's the original H.D. Wells book that started it all. Which I must say I am finally working my way through in Bitmap Book's awesome reprinting of the original story which includes some damn fine artwork. Well worth checking out, I must say. Or perhaps it's one of the many other crazy amounts of art forms that this popular IP has found itself a part of, such as comics, including the obscure crossover ones of course, really really bad sequels, sculptures, or perhaps, and let's be honest, it's the one that the vast majority of you are already thinking of, yes, it's video games. <laughs> no, no, no. Out of all the mediums that that original 1898 science fiction novel has influenced, video games are far from the top of anybody's list. But still, they do have quite the varied history, and today, we're going to be covering them all. Yeah, sadly, some of these games are actually pretty impressive, but they're completely forgotten about when they're going up against the far more popular mediums that this series has influenced. And for me, as good as some of these games are, none of them hold a candle to Jeff Wayne's incredible concept album. As a youngster, I would listen to this outstanding album on tape, on vinyl, on CD, looking at the stunning Mike Trim artwork, and I became seriously obsessed with it. For me, even though it technically wouldn't even exist without the original story, nothing has been more impactful to fans of the tale than this, as it's also influenced stage shows, a sadly unreleased animated movie, the upcoming VR experience in London, which yes, you can be damn sure that I will be attending. But but more importantly for this episode, it too also influenced some games. And today not only are we going to be looking at the history of the original tale, the making of it and the legacy that it left behind, but of course we'll also be looking at the games too. Hi everybody, I'm DJ Slope from Slope's Game Room and this is the War of the Worlds, the history and the games. Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millette and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. In 1866, Herbert George Wells, the eventual father of science fiction as he would eventually be known for, was born about an hour away from me in Bromley in Kent. He was raised with the belief of Christianity pushed down upon him by his mother in a very much middle class family as well as his father, although his father was an avid cricket player spending most of his time either playing or with friends at the local cricket club, it was very much the mother who raised Herbert and his two brothers herself. 
Being that this was a middle class family in Victorian England, it wasn't uncommon for families such as the Wells to try their best to raise their social hierarchy as best they could. It was said that Sarah, his mother, just like most did at the time, always aimed to be part of that higher social group and often looked down on those beneath her whilst looking up to those with far wealthier income than that of her own. She did this by not letting Herbert and his brothers out to play in order to keep their clothes lasting longer among other things, and Herbert absolutely hated this way of thinking, eventually going against many religious beliefs and taking on the opinion that everybody should be treated equally. He often found himself going up against his mother's wishes and after the death of his family's only daughter, with Herbert being the youngest of the three, as you can imagine, he soon became the unnamed favourite, quite spoiled and often throwing tantrums when things didn't go his way. One day at the age of eight, he broke his leg after a supposed wrestling match with his brothers and during that recovery became a bit of a social invalid as he became obsessed with books. As the weeks and months drifted away, Herbert became fascinated with books with a special interest falling into war-themed tales that showed heroic acts, which again further strengthened his disbelief for religious beliefs no matter how much his mother tried to change that opinion. As the books became a bigger part of his life, he attended school and soon became the top of his class and although plenty of family money troubles came and went, Herbert's hunger for education only grew stronger and stronger. And long story short, no matter how many apprenticeships that his mother tried to bestow onto him, he always found himself going to school to study and of course eventually start writing. As time went on after school, he became a respected teacher and after he became ill, forcing him to quit that job, he rested up with his mother again for the best part of a decade, where you guessed it, reading took over and more importantly, writing took over. He had already dabbled in the realm of science fiction with his short story in 1988 titled The Chronic Argonauts, which eventually became the basis of his more popular book, The Time Machine, a book which merges the science fiction idea of breaking the fourth dimension with a time machine with his views on splitting up classes as the star of the book travels to a future Britain where the wealthy live happily above ground and the poor live underground running the machinery for the higher-ups' perfect little life. This led to the island of Dr. Moreau, a Frankenstein-like story based on a mad scientist creating human-like hybrid beings from animals on a deserted island, something he was obviously inspired by during his scientific studies and his beliefs. This was the book that pushed Wells over the edge and he became ever more popular all over, with further releases such as The Invisible Man coming shortly after. For anybody out there that has read or at least knows what these stories are about, it's pretty obvious that Herbert George Wells was fascinated in understanding what we as humans would do or how we would act under strange scientific-esque settings. And then of course, there was this one. A sort of a short story that was being written between April of 1897 and December of the same year in Pearson's magazine called The War of the Worlds, which he was paid £200 to complete. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is The War of the Worlds as it was originally seen by the average wealthy Victorian homeowner as these images you see drawn by Warwick Globe were what people originally thought of when the Martians were attacking us. Obviously these short stories constantly leaning into one another are not exactly anything too in depth as he eventually adapted his collective works into one book with plenty of extra storyline being added and in 1898 easily his most popular book was released and the world of science fiction has never been the same since. The story of War of the Worlds is a story poking fun at a Victorian Britain. We claim to be the most advanced, educated and sophisticated nation in the world and HG Wells, as already stated, hated that image that he was sadly a part of and in retaliation wanted to show that we was no different than anybody else when beings far greater than our own from the red planet invaded my neck of the woods. Again, like I said, this story is based only a couple of hours from my house. With the British Empire being the predominant colonial and naval power on the globe at the time, what better way to show us up than to have big bad boy tripods come down and demolish it all. 
A lot of these early designs and ideas would later shape not only plenty of revisions and reimaginings of the classic story, but science fiction writing, movies and literature for many years to come. It's a fantastic story about the struggles of just a few people and the things that you're willing to do when everyone, no matter who you are, are stripped from their social hierarchy and forced to fight or run together or alone. It's the kind of story that leaves you thinking, what would you do? And hidden beneath the cool special effects and awesome designs and the arguments about which tripod possibly looks best, the most important thing to remember is, if your favourite version doesn't have the struggling fight for survival at the core of its comic movie game or book, then it's just not a proper War of the Worlds adaption. For me, this is what makes it great, and this is what the very best versions nail from the get-go. Continuing with the 1938 Orson Welles radio broadcast adaption. By this point, War of the Worlds had done the rounds quite nicely, officially and unofficially. Regardless, it had gained serious traction, especially with the infamous radio broadcast that played in 1938, where the incredible Orson Welles directed the Mercury Theatre to broadcast a dramatic retelling of the popular book that was done at a time when constant musical pieces would be interrupted by the luring threat of World War II, and this piece would be structured in the exact same way, with short musical interludes being interrupted with fake news stories of aliens landing, invading and destroying a America. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. Reports that this caused an insane amount of listeners to actually believe that this was happening became rampant all over the papers, giving the impression that the fight for survival had very much entered the real world did indeed happen, but only in a few instances. Those unlucky enough to channel surf their way to the station after the introduction explained that this was just simply a drama, for the most part, just didn't fall for it. After all, it was only an hour long, however, the images of those happening to only a few people is enough to make me love the work of both Orson Welles and, of course, H.G. Wells even more. Anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires are... The gas tank, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, it's about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. <laughs> Not in 53 rolled round and we got to see our first movie adaption of the classic tale. Although going back now for new viewers, this can be a pretty hard film to realise, especially knowing about the source material. It did still show off the struggle of mankind when going up against the Martians, that and it was stupidly colourful, even to this day a real feast for the eyes and well worth a watch, even if the tripods don't have legs. Supported from the ground by rays, probably some form of magnetic flux like invisible eggs. <laughs> oh, don't give me any of that. Another reenactment, which was the first of many, showed tribute to Orson Welles' broadcast in 1968 to mark the 30th anniversary of the original radio drama. And before we get into the games, how can we not talk about what is without a doubt my personal favourite version, which is of course, Jeff Wayne's musical version of The War of the Worlds, a dramatic prog rock fantasy string based musical retelling of the incredible story. 
This is essentially Jack and Ori for your parents, folks. Incredible music accompanied by excellent voice work by Richard Burton to take you along for the ride. If you've never heard of this incredible piece of music before, then change that. I'm sure you can ask your parents, your auntie or your uncle, someone. They will definitely have a copy to lend you. And with the lights dimmed, looking over the excellent artwork of what most people believe are the very best designs of the tripods with your headphones on, listening to one of the the best selling albums of all time. It's the way to experience War of the Worlds. <laughs> and seriously, guys, this thing sold like gangbusters. It still does to this day, almost surpassing the popularity of the original book, getting reimaginings done of it, stage shows, and even a virtual reality tour based around the stories found within the concept album. And that will be opening up in just a month or so via dot 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 in London. And like I said, guys, I am seriously going to be going to this, and it's going to be awesome. Seriously, the legacy that this exceptional piece of work has left behind is one that will outlive us all. And yes, it even influenced video games too. But before we get into those ones, there is one video game released in 1982 that is not only incredibly rare, but is actually based on the original book. And it sucks. The year is 1982 and Cinematronics were still doing what they could in regard to vector graphics, and War of the Worlds was the last one that they ever made. Originally looked at as a 3D version of Space Invaders, what you got is... Well, it's a 3D version of Space Invaders. You know, that game that came out four years earlier and was better. Your aim is to simply shoot the alien tripods as they get close to you and very briefly put up your shields when they shoot their heat rays near you. It's incredibly basic and like I said, Space Invaders plus about 1000 other ripoffs did it better. In fact, the colour version was actually a sort of a redesign from the original arcade that was originally released back in 1979, a year after Space Invaders. Even though both games play exactly the same, the original was pure white even though it was coded to be played in colour, which is all just very odd. Thankfully there has actually been a fan remake of this, so if you own a Vectrex and I suppose a fair amount of money, then you can play this one. But then again, you know, maybe not, because like I said, this game isn't all that good. It doesn't actually look all that bad, to be fair, but after showing it off at a trade show and getting some pretty bad feedback, they decided to scrap the vast majority of its production, and although I can't actually find any evidence to prove this fact, I have read a few times online that less than 10 machines were ever made of the original, and approximately 3 were made of the colour version. If you ever see it in the wild, it's most definitely worth trying. You know, just to say you have. Next up was Jeff Wayne's video game version of The War of the Worlds, created by just one 15-year-old lad and released by CRL for the ZX Spectrum and all of these home computers too. Except, it was only ever released on the ZX Spectrum because, again, it's not very good. In the game, you need to very slowly walk from screen to screen in six different locations, essentially trying not to die. Now, obviously, the game had a lot to live up to, being that it was following on from the album and not the book or movie, which, as I stated earlier, was doing very, very well. It sadly just didn't deliver. Yep, it's slow, it's boring, and well, it could have been so much more. Most of the time you die simply from hunger or thirst, and all that doesn't sound action-y enough for a Martian invading video game, for me, it's actually quite a neat idea. In fact, Jeff Wayne himself was supposed to be part of its production. He had apparently turned down plenty of other studio offers to make the perfect game, and CRL were the company he signed up with. The trick of the game is really just trial and error. Do you run? Do you hide? And more importantly, where do you go and in what order do you play it? You could play and die repeatedly, which I'm guessing most reviewers did, trying to work this game out. But the real trick to this whole thing is that your answers are actually hidden in the album. If you want to survive, you need to listen to find out the location order, among other things. This, for me, makes the idea of the game rather impressive. And sure, they never really did too well creating that environment, for the player to play in, at least they had a good go of turning an album into a rather unique gaming experience. A missed opportunity with a bucket load of brilliant ideas. 
Which is why it probably took a whole 14 years before we got another game. A game that most people would have believed is the best War of the Worlds game ever created. Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds by Rage Software. This is a strategy game, where you get to choose to play as the Martians or the humans, obviously attacking or defending. Now straight off the bat, the game obviously has some incredible style, the cutscenes, although dated by today's standards, still look and feel exceptional, and exactly what I think of when I think of War of the Worlds. In fact, the almost 90s cheap CGI feel about them makes me kinda like them more, and Jeff Wayne even used some of the cutscenes in a few segments for his live show too, so you know, they are the best that they could have been for the time. So yeah, the look and feel is spot on, but guys, the music is by far the very best thing about this game. Seriously, it's still one of the very best soundtracks of any game ever. You see, by late 1990 standards, the Ministry of Sound-like trance music was very much at the top of its popularity, and the best of the best in that genre actually worked with Jeff Wayne on this soundtrack. I would love to play these tracks here, but you know, for obvious reasons I can't, so if I was you, I'd open up another tab and get searching. If you're a fan, you will not regret it. It's the perfect companion to the futuristic for the time gameplay found within. And what of the gameplay? Well, by RTS standards, it is actually a really solid game. A game where you need to control the missions yourself and attempt to take over or protect Britain region by region. It was one of the first RTS games that had 3D graphics rather than sprites, and also one of the first that I remember that let you actually place what you want, where you want, rather than in a grid. Although, I've got to say I do prefer the grid style of gameplay in RTS, but you know, whatever. My biggest issue is the fact that I'm way too big of a War of the Worlds fan. I'm just a massive nerd. Look, the game itself is fully solid. Classic strategy fans will love it. But I don't know, having waves of fast moving, almost clumsy looking tripods running towards bases, it just feels a little bit naff. When I look at the artwork and the movies, I see these things as huge, horror-like, unbeatable structures that can't really be taken down unless using complete brute force to do so, which for the most part we don't have, especially in that time period. It's just not that scary or worrying enough for me, and sadly because I'm such a geek, I can't get rid of that feeling when playing this game. Or the PlayStation game that came out just one year later. This one used a lot of the same cutscenes and music, making it yet again feel like it's the perfect sort of War of the Worlds game, but my god, the Ula screaming Martians that gave us all nightmares when we were kids are complete pushovers in this game. Have you ever wanted to see what happens when you mix this musical masterpiece with, I don't know, twisted metal? <laughs> no, me neither. But here we go anyway. As you can see, it's gone for a far more third person style this time, with more of a focus on heavy car combat than anything else. Sure, the actual graphics look like a trip to Legoland Windsor nowadays, but for the time, well, actually, they were pretty blocky by 1999 standards too. Thankfully, the game itself is actually quite fun. It's aged pretty badly nowadays, but it's still quite good with plenty of tactics and gameplay changes thrown around to make it from becoming stale. My only real issue with it is that the Martians, yet again, don't feel all that threatening at all. Every type of fighting machine you go up against definitely has weak points that it claims you'll need to master, but only in the beginning as I always found out the best way to destroy was just to simply go to town shooting them. Which yet again kind of defeats the idea of the War of the Worlds tripods. Thankfully, like I said, the game isn't actually that bad with 14 levels in total and just like the last time, the music is absolutely stunning. In fact, I actually own the original version of these soundtracks, which actually have become quite the rarity nowadays. Worth it for the music alone. <sighs> right, what's next? Well, a good few years passed whilst we waited for our next instalment. In fact, everything War of the Worlds went a little bit quiet at this point. You had the Superman War of the Worlds comic getting released around the same time, but that's about it. However, behind the scenes, Steven Spielberg was working on a brand new almost disaster type movie retelling of the classic tale which was released in 2005. My thoughts on the movie? Honestly, I quite like it. The designs are great to look at, the characters are, 
well, most of them are all right, at least, but most importantly, the struggle can be felt throughout the vast majority of this movie, and it's done better here than any other movie or show to date. When watching it back for the making of this video, the suspense and the crazy situations that the characters go through in their struggle to fight or flee from the Martians is actually incredibly memorable. I enjoyed the 2005 movie and although I would have done it differently myself, I think War of the Worlds is something that has been retold so many times that every single person watching this video I'm sure would have a different opinion on what they would want to do with the franchise. What we got though really wasn't that bad, even if it did have bad points about it, including the utterly confusing storyline of having the Martian tripods being hidden beneath us and we just didn't know they were there. I mean, come on, seriously? Underneath us and we didn't know about it? Nope, I'm not having that. But, say what you want of the film, thankfully, we did get a game based on it. A very small browser-based game that actually made quite a bit of sense. This is War of the Worlds Tripod Attack, and although basic, it does just one job and it does it pretty well. Obviously, this time your job is to wipe out the human race and you do that by choosing where you want to shoot and doing just that. The challenge comes in not only choosing who to take out first, but obviously keeping an eye on your heat ray, your shield and of course your armour. The further the game gets, the harder this obviously becomes and yeah, that is literally it. Nothing much here, after all, is a free browser game. And I also gotta mention the Java game for phones too. And <laughs> I'll tell you what guys, this is actually not that bad at all. I'm a big fan of the sprite work, it's definitely the better version out of the two. And, well, I ended up playing this quite a lot during the production of this video. Okay, so we are into the home stretch now, moving into the final two games so far in the series, both of which were released in 2011, one year after the rather impressive Smashing Ideas HG Wells Interactive book, an often forgotten about app that by all accounts reads quite nicely. But anyway, the first game released out of those two in 2011 was yet another iOS exclusive app full of mini games, yet again retelling the story. This is very much a mix between those puzzle finding games with crazy amounts of detail in every image blending together with very, very basic adventure game storyline elements. As far as games like this go, it's not that bad. Definitely worth having a look at if you have a tablet and hopefully it does end up hitting Android stores too one day. Which finally leaves me just to one game, which is sadly the final one for this video, and for me personally, it's my favourite of every game released so far. And that is, of course, War of the Worlds. I mean, come on, was it ever going to be called anything else? London, England. Our worst fears have become reality today, as alien forces have invaded. Panic reigns throughout the country, and indeed the world. Can anyone save us? I could hear the great thump of their mechanical legs smashing down behind me. We were under attack. Not from another nation as in times gone past, but from some far greater, more malevolent power. How could we fight an enemy we could not even imagine? In the space of a few hours, my world had been turned on its head. We realized the terrible truth, the uncertainty of humankind's survival. Like I said earlier guys, my vision of the perfect War of the Worlds game, movie, comic or musical is that of just a single person or a few running from the Martians hopelessly, showing off the struggles of mankind when put up against something far greater and more powerful than us. And the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 game is probably the closest thing we have ever got to the perfect game. Similar to games such as Flashback, where this game very much took inspiration from, what you got is obviously a cinematic platformer perfectly retelling the classic story only progressing every time you take the character into the next invisible checkpoint. 
Now, if you are aware of this game already, you may be confused and wondering exactly why I'm praising it so much. It's not a very respected game at all. But, guys, as far as War of the Worlds video games go, this one hit the nail on the head for a retro gamer like myself, as it is simply a retelling of the story with beautiful imagery, great sounds, and get this, the narrator is only bloody Patrick Stewart, isn't it? Sadly, the controls are far from perfect, but then again, look at Flashback, a game that you need to learn to play. A monster comes running at you, and what do you do? You slowly turn around. That's one action. You start running. That's another action. Pray to God you hit the controller at the exact right time to make the hero jump. It's all very basic and slow, but just like that game, this has an incredible story that makes you want to keep trying again and again and again to see what happens next. I'm not 100% sure why it did so bad, I mean yes I know it doesn't play brilliantly, but it was still an excellent retelling and is the exact game I would imagine up if I had to make a War of the Worlds game. But hey, that's just how it is. It sold so incredibly badly that it simply doesn't exist anymore. Wanna get it on your PS3 or PS4? Nope. It's gone. If you want to get it on your Xbox 360, it is too gone. Which is strange because you can still download the demo on your 360, but when you actually try to buy it, you simply can't. It's just not available anymore. Time to start J tagging your consoles, guys, because sadly there really is no other way to play this one. It's a quality little title that I don't think got anywhere near the amount of attention that it deserves, and because of that, you simply can't play more than a demo of it nowadays. Which just leaves dot dot dot's VR immersion experience in London. Yeah, I know it's not a game as such, or at least I don't believe it is. But for me, it just goes to show that the world of the War of the Worlds is far from over. Not only with this, but a brand new Victorian age three-part TV show on the book coming this year in 2019. And guys... I think that's a good place to stop right there. If you are still watching this and you're not a fan, then hopefully this video will showcase why it's just so goddamn important. And hey, maybe you are now. As a fan myself, do I suggest checking out the games first? <laughs> no. Go and get the book or the soundtrack first and see where it takes you. War of the Worlds will continue to outlive us all, and for me it's something that at this point has been reimagined so bloody much that I'm more than happy for the book or the musical to be adapted into any media format imaginable, whether it's been done already or not. After all, the chances of anything coming from Mars are a million to one, he said. But still, they come. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. I want to give a big special shout out to all of my patrons, but first let's give an extra big shout out to this video sponsor, Player One Clothing. If you want to check the clothing that you saw in this video and plenty of other incredible video game related garments, then please check the link below. It does indeed help the show. And of course, if you want to check the game out that's playing on the screen right here, then there'll be an affiliate link down below for that too. And finally, a big special shout out goes to Bitmap Books who gave me a copy of their War of the Worlds book which helped very much with the making of this video. But anyway, back to those patrons. A big extra, big extra, big shout out going to that retro video gamer Gary Pinkett, Mantis, Ryan Burford, Andrew Dalton, Jonathan Hayward, Tomek Rabowski, Christopher Turnbull, Brent Craft, Ben Jackson, Phil Lowlands, Mr. Vestek, Dina, Robertson Dunn, Lefty Intrigued Gaming, Abby Morris, Tim Labonte, Asobi Quang, DX, Tim Lunn, Genovi, Hernanaz, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Kareemi, Elephant James, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, King Link Reviews, Retro Gaming Castle, Savage and Mr. Drew, Gemma at Mr. T's Shirts, Monster Finger Games, Creators of Alien Scumbag, Mike H. Fell, Looser Softail, Ye Old Hamburglar, Gregory Arden, Bew Wright, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King and Mocat Tyndall, June, The Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Poolblow, G, and of course, Petty Mew. 
you. If you want to get your name shouted out, come and see what I'm working on and all of the other usual stuff that these patrons always get that you don't, then please click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, a thumbs down, whatever you prefer. But for now, guys, this video is so hard to make. I'm going to go and enjoy having a barbecue with my family. So for now, this is DJ Slope signing out. And hopefully I'll see you all next time.